Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry and it's time for some more Blood Sword. Now, at the end of the last episode it became apparent that we are to rendezvous with the ghost ship of Hunguk the Pirate King while it is briefly upon this earthly plain, in the middle of the ocean, in the Great Gulf, and we need to find a way to get there. We are heading to a fishing village perhaps to attempt to purchase a boat. However, we met a chap by the side of the road who wished to share his wine with us. Wine or... Hmm. It is wine, yeah. I'll recap the last paragraph so we can get back into it. Your wandering brings you to the outskirts of the city proper. Seeing a fishing village in the distance, you head towards it with a view to hiring a small boat. You soon find the village is further than you thought, for you are forced to take a meandering path between a number of low, sealed stone buildings. The time is now mid-afternoon, and dry dust rises chokingly from the road. As you turn a bend, you come across a man sitting by the roadside drinking from a gourd. He looks up and smiles, greeting you with the words, we must swelter in the sun while those who lie in those sepulchres are cool, but they must endure their parched throats, as this wine is only for the living. He holds up the gourd. Will you join me? We might as well accept his invitation. The Ta'ashim do seem to be a hospitable people. You sit down and take a long swig from the gourd. The wine is deliriously cool and refreshing. Have you come far? asks the man, mopping his tanned brow. From Chrysentium. And going far? You take another gulp of wine before passing the gourd back. Shall we tell him where we are bound? He does seem very inquisitive, but perhaps he's just being friendly. Or should we prefer to not discuss the details of our quest with this stranger? You know what? I think we are going to tell him we're going to that fishing village over there. And while we sit here partaking of refreshments, now would be a good time to make a two-point healing roll. Hey, spend two points, get four points back. So we give the two back to Brother Kern and then... Our only wounded party member. Oh no, everyone's healthy. I didn't need to risk a healing roll. Oh, well, oh, that's going to come back to bite me the next time I need to make one, isn't it? <laughs> uh, in order to rendezvous with a certain vessel, it is important to find some way to get 60 miles out into the Gulf. The rendezvous is to take place in two days' time. You withhold any details that might reveal the full nature of your quest. I mean, that was pretty revelatory. Yes. Since you do not know who the man is, this precaution seems worth taking. How fortunate you have spoken of this to me, he replies. For I truly believe that your quest would have been doomed to failure if you had not. He's slurring his words slightly because he has been drinking, possibly rather heavily. You see, it is well known that at this time of year the gulf is frequented by a gargantuan sea monster called the Dendan. Fishermen are frightened of high waves and clinging to the shore as a babe to its mother's breast. You would never have found anyone willing to lend you his boat for such a venture. His effusive words make you suspicious. We could ask him to explain how he can help. Or we can decide to bid him good afternoon and continue on our way. We'll ask him how he can help. The man, who now introduces himself as Galor, the tomb robber, leads you away from the mausoleums and points up a steep hillside path. Recently, while sitting here one afternoon, I was taken by an urge to have gull's eggs for my supper. There is none to be found of a necropolis, of course, so I went up this path to see if any gulls were nesting on the hillside. I found none, but I discovered a great marvel, for I stumbled upon a cave where the fabled rock has its nest. Now, if you know your legends, then you will need no telling that the rock is a giant bird which from Mariner Simbar encountered on one of his voyages. 
You will also be aware of how Simba made use of the bird to enter the inviolable citadel of Shazer of Witch. He tied himself to the rock's claw while the bird was asleep and took it to the air. And, and when it took to the air, it bore him aloft with it. Which should, of course, remind us of the epic story of Simbad the Sailor and his seven voyages. No, not the various films that have been made. I'm talking like the original stuff, right? And what's actually really nice is it doesn't start with Sinbad starting out on his first voyage. It actually starts at the end of the story with him inviting someone into his, into his mansion and telling him the story of how he became so powerful. It's a story within a story. We do have a sage here. What does he know? Shazira could be a reference to Scheherazade. I am not entirely certain. Anyway, whoa, I don't look too far there. Right. The legend Galor has related is just as you have read it in various ancient books. However, the version you know also includes the secret word that Simba used to make the rock land when he reached his destination. This word was Tawi. Now, after some discussion among the group, Remy and Brother Kern point out that while we control can control when the rock lands, we cannot control where it flies, in which direction, or how hastily. So it is decided that perhaps it is best not to pursue this particular avenue any further. We shall bid him farewell and go on our way. Plus, he's a tomb robber. He's hardly an honourable fellow. You stroll down the road to the village. You have barely passed the first cottage when you are surrounded by dozens of scrawny Ta'ashim children, brown as nuts, who pluck at your robes and screech at you to give them money. We can give them a gold piece to quiet them down, or give them a cuff round the ear and send them off. Um, you know what, Sir Alwyn is honourable. He'll part with a coin. There are properties. There we go. Takes him down to 71. More gracious and generous. Um, Brother Kern is also gracious and generous, but also not quite so worldly. He would be the first to part with money, but he does have a little less, and maybe the others should even it out a bit. Maybe Remy should, but he's a tight ass. He's not going to spend money. Now, this could be one of those situations you give the pack of beggars money and more and more come and start pestering you. And again, they are children and we are a fearsome group. We can probably terrify them if we have to. The nearest child takes the coin. The din of shouting immediately stops as they all stare in disbelief at the glittering gold. Now be off with you, you say, not unkindly. Okay. Now be off with you, you say, not unkindly. The silence lasts a few seconds more, then the whole crowd comes to life as one. They tear off down the road, cheering, kicking up billows of dust as they go. You watch the child of the coin toss it up into the air, seeing his smile when the sunlight glances off it as it spins. The father of all sees your kindness and will ensure you are rewarded for it. You turn. Beside you stands an extremely old and gnarled Ta'ashim woman with a face roughly the shape of a turnip. Will you enter my home? she says. We could accept the invitation, and we probably should, because the Ta'ashim do seem to have a tradition of good hospitality. And we have been nice to the children, so she will be disposed towards us. However, we could also decline, explaining that we must be on our way. Now, inside this old hovel is the ebony flying horse. And if we enter, the old woman and her son or grandson will give it to us because we have the wooden peg that can make it fly. And that would allow us to fly out across the gulf and arrive in time to get to Hongguk's ship. 
it would be the safest way of getting there. However, I don't want to take that particular route because there's something else I want to do first before I get on the water. So we will decline her offer, unfortunately, which means we didn't need to go to such an effort to get the peg, although it was still worth it, as we shall discover. You continue along the road, gazing out to sea as you walk. It is two days... Si Wait, what the fuck? No, hang on. Did I take a wrong turn here? One moment. Is it 124? It was, wasn't it? Um, 82. Hang on, hang on, hang on. 82, it's 93. Do I have to not give the coin to the beggars? Um, 82, just quick check, don't have a magic carpet, 577, I think giving the coin to the beggars was, children was a mistake, oh no, no, there we go, 82 it is, yes. Because I'm pretty sure there is a dead end option where you just can't go any further because you can't get there in time. You continue along the road, gazing out to sea as you walk. In two days, 60 miles to the south, Hunguk's ship will sail into the mundane world for a short while. But will you be able to get there in time to intercept it? Do you have the magic carpet of Augustus of Vantary from The Adventure of the Kingdom of Weird? Book 2. We do not. There was a way we could have gained possession of it, but it would not have been by meeting him when we were... Oh, no, no, there is a way. We could have got a ride on his carpet. Essentially, we would have needed to be flying on the carpet with him and then gain it from him in one way or another. We do not possess such an item, so we must walk on into the fishing village. See? Old memories. I mean, pretty old memories at this point. <laughs> you espy a fisherman who has a particular shiftless look about him. Though his nets are worn in many places and the corking on his boat shows need of work, he is merely lounging beside it, carving a small doll of driftwood. Under the gaze of his heavy-lidded eyes, you trudge down the beach towards him. Now, he doesn't look particularly... Arabian. And the headscarf kind of is the features they look more European. I think that's more to do with the artist. But I feel that changing the artist to gain a more European style of imagery for this one book in the series, uh, sorry, a more Arabian style of imagery for this one book in the series, would have like alienated the images as they would have jumped from one art style to another and then back again for the later books. And having the one artist consistently do all the pictures for all the books was a good touch. And this is the world view of the heroes, the, the way they view things, not necessarily the way things are. I am Warak, the son of Abdallah, the net maker, he says. Well, mate, your nets are, nets are shit. They need repairing badly. If I may serve you without rising to my feet, then it will be my pleasure to do so. How much will you take for your boat? Do you ask him. A crafty look comes into his eyes. The boat is old. I ask only five gold pieces or something of like value. But if I should meet my wife, do not tell her you bought it. The story I shall give her is that it sank and that I barely escaped with my life. So she won't know he got the money. Uh, understood. You must pay him five gold pieces if you have that much. Remy blatantly has that much. And it's about time he paid for something. We'll knock him down to 79 gold. There we go. If not, he will accept an item instead. Decide what you are giving for the boat and make the necessary deduction from your character sheets. If there is a trickster in the party and he or she has at least one gold piece left, indeed there is.
On a sudden impulse, you offer Wurak a gold piece for the wooden figurine he is whittling. Agreed, he says at once, taking the coin. I can carve more if you like. You turn the little mannequin over in your hands, now wondering if you were rash to buy it. No, one will do. Remy now has a wooden mannequin, and he will... Ooh, what are we going to get rid of here? Does anyone? Um, we should have just given him one of these items instead. Okay. Well, Prince Sazorian's astrological projection is not... We haven't been told to add it as an item. So I'm going to take that off. And Remy can give some of his food to Ariadne. And a wooden figurine. Well, that's not how you spell figurine, is it? There we go. Because you will recall the Hatuli, the wooden figurine, that uh, Prince Sasurian has assured us, once the magical gems are placed in its eye sockets, will be able to lead us to the blade of the blood sword. Remy's got a sneaky idea that he may be able to substitute this for it. And just in case we do need to keep the charts, um, we'll get rid of these four candles. Prince Sosurian's astrological projections. You know what? If that, yeah, that's the only type of that did well there. Okay. The handling of a small boat is a matter of plain common sense, were Wurak's parting words to you. As you scull out across the bay, rumbling to raise the sail, you begin to wonder about that. You also realise why you would not have bothered to haggle over the price, for it is necessary to bail water constantly as the boat is at the very lowest limit of seaworthiness, as was blatantly mentioned in the description. You must pray that you enjoy clear weather and a calm sea until you reach your destination. But on this occasion, as on so many others, your prayers are not to be answered. Well, clearly, we are going to be on some sea, so I did prepare a map for that. There we are, beautiful map with, you know, stuff in the sky there. I know it's horses, but they look a little bit like a ship. We've got a kind of wrecked ship ahead, a, a little boat here. We have our four heroes on the water. Nice, big. Map for us to play on. We can move around on this if we have to. Let's see how things go. You sail south, checking your heading from time to time against the astrological chart that Sosurian gave you. Soon you begin to relax and enjoy the voyage, basking in the afternoon sun and sniffing the bracing salty air. Even the bailing turns out to be a less demanding chore than you had feared. Towards sunset you are hailed by a group of fishing boats returning to shore. They appear as black ink scratches against the blazing red of the western horizon. When you call back to the fishermen in Biolang, Biolang, they shout something and sail on. Day retreats from the sky, revealing the stars one by one. A cool breeze blows across your bows and shrieking gulls wheel above you. A sense of sudden foreboding makes you shudder. Something touches your fingers, which are trailing lazily in the warm water. You go rigid, staring around. The sea is filled with the bodies of hundreds of dead fish. The waters churn and froth. And we haven't had to deduct any of the rations we purchased yet. 
Were they just a way to get us to waste money and fill up our inventories? Or was there going to be uh, eating required, as in the journey in book two, and then it was overlooked or removed or they, you know, the author forgot to put it in? I don't know. Your boat is swept crazily in a swirling current as something rears up out of the sea. At first you cannot tell what it is, for it is too big for a single glance to take it in. Then you see that it is a giant fin as big as a mountainside. A colossal fish is surfacing from the depths under you. Each of its scales is like a dozen copper shields, and with the opening of its cavernous mouth it creates a whirlpool. Your tiny vessel is sucked down. Did you hear the tale of the sailor at the Tower of the Purple Throne of Purple? Yes, we did! Yes, we did! And we did bother to listen to the story. So even though we didn't get the flying wooden horse... We heard the tale. The sailor mentioned this sea monster, the Dendan, he called it. Perhaps you recall him mentioning a sorcerer who calmed a monster with magic words. What were the words? Hui Yu Yang? Yes. Ching Tso? Or Li Chuo Hao Chuo? Chu, chu. It was Hui Yu Yang. As our sage well recalls. The Dendan stops moving and sinks slowly below the waves. You slump to the bottom of the boat, shaking uncontrollably now that the danger is past. Nervous exhaustion gives way to sleep, and you drift on in the grip of a gentle sea breeze. When you wake the next day, it is to find water lapping around your ankles, but once you have bailed out, you find you only have to make a slight correction to your course. It is almost as though the wind and the ocean currents are conspiring to bring you to your fateful rendezvous. After two days at sea, you sight the tiny barren isle, which, which marks where Hunguk's ship will appear. Each wounded player can restore four endurance points for rest during the voyage, with an additional two endurance points if he or she has something to eat. We will mark off food, so four, eight, we'll just take off this seven, and knock that down to a six. You put into shore and wait for the Devil's Runner to show. At this point, you may notice from the clock down in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen that I have suffered yet another late-night interruption. Yeah, my father came downstairs. He couldn't sleep. He was too hot and uncomfortable. He sat in the armchair for a bit, had a cold drink eventually decided to go back upstairs to bed again and by that point I was already halfway through an episode or something so I decided to finish it off before getting back to this. So you put into shore and wait for the devil's runner to show. 488 so back up a bit. Mist rolls in around the island as the sun sets. Almost choking in the dank air, you peer out from the shore, trying to catch a glimpse of Hongguk's ship. If Susurian's astrology is right, it should be very near. A rumbling vibration judders through the rocks at your feet. It is a sound too low for human hearing, and it heralds the arrival of the Pirate King's ship. Against the backdrop of fog, the Devil's Runner looms as big as a castle and slides slowly past. If we had a flying horse, we could make great use of it. We do not, though. We have a boat. So it's a, it's a rubbish boat in a terrible state. Let's see if it'll get us to the vessel before it sinks. You almost do not need to row. As soon as you are caught in the current of the ship's bowels, you seem to be dragged towards her as though by an invisible hand. At one point, you glance down into the water and glimpse a scarlet human-faced eel thrashing mortally in the unbreathable ocean of Middle-earth. It was presumably trapped in the undertow and pulled along with the Devil's Runner from whatever unearthly rail realm she last sailed through. The creature stares back at you with a look of desolate horror, then is dragged down out of sight. 
Your prow bumps against the ship's side. Tevering your boat to the end of a mooring chain which dangles from a rail, you climb up onto the deck. We've made it onto the Devil's Runner. Excellent. In its perpetual shroud of fog, the Devil's Runner seems to hang in a space between worlds. Dazed by a sense of disorientation and timelessness, you stare down from the rail. You can no longer make out the surface of the ocean or even hear the waves lapping against the hull. Intermittent moans come from far away, like the lost cries of all the sailors who have ever been lost at sea. You shake off such thoughts and begin to explore the deck. The ship is big, larger than the largest crusader vessels which can hold a thousand men. You estimate it to be thirty paces across the beam, standing perhaps twelve metres out of the water. It has several stout copper-clad masts, but the sails look useless, just tattered cobweb sheets of mouldered canvas. Finding a companionway decorated with demonic carvings, you're about to go below deck when you spot a finger, figure lingering by the wheel. Reeved in the eldritch fog, his long cape gives him the appearance of a tall black bat. Let's go speak to him. On this ghost ship, anyone might be worth approaching, although we do want to be cautious. We don't want to fall for any tricks and traps. You draw near the strange figure, but leave enough distance between you so that the fog spares you the details of his face. His cheeks are hard and sallow, and he seems to be wear to wear a disquietingly fixed grin. Do you know who I am? His voice suggests a, a gusty grey storm. Your gorge rises you as you smell his rank breath. Hunguk the Pirate King, you reply. Hunguk! <laughs> he chuckles. Not I. I'm Shambir, Hunguk's trusty steersman. See this wheel? My old hands haven't left this wheel in seven mortal lifetimes. Outlived his own flesh in the service of Hunguk. That's what they'll say of old Shambir. Under his long cape, thin shoulders twitch as he gives a wan laugh. You start to ask him a question, but he snaps his jaw and stares intently into the fog dead ahead. Caligosums and Luridors all about us, he yells. No peace for the wicked, eh? Now ask a question and be quick about it, for if I'm distracted from my job, then Satan's hounds will have all our bones to gnaw. If you're only going to get the chance for one question, you better make it count. What will it be? Where are the emeralds Hunguk stole from Sa'ak Nafur? Where is Hunguk, or where is the ship bound? We came for the emeralds, so we're going to ask, Where are the emeralds Hunguk stole from Sa'ak Nafur? Sa'ak Nafur is such a great name, so memorable. I still occasionally remember it and wonder where I remember it from, and then occasionally remember it's from this book. <laughs> so that's what you're after. <laughs> Cackle Shambir. They're in his cabin, I suppose. Go below and head towards the stern, but don't drag your feet. <laughs> his skeletal frame is racked with silent laughter as you step down into the gloomy companionway. And now we should be below decks. If there is an enchantress in the party, if there absolutely is, and she wishes to act, yeah, I think she should. Let's go for it. Oop, little too far there, little too far. There we go. Shambir has warned you that time is of the essence. You call the prediction spell to mind and cast it, obtaining glimpses of the near future. 
This spell will enable you to explore the ship more efficiently, eliminating wrong turnings and delays before they occur. Put a tick on a piece of paper and write the number 422 above it. Um... Four hundred twenty-two and a one tick. Here we go. As you turn to successive paragraphs, you will be told to record more ticks. These ticks are keeping track of the time you spend searching the ship, and once you have a total of ten ticks, you should turn immediately to four hundred twenty-two. After recording your first tick, turn to four hundred eighty-seven. Now, you might think, well, then how did the how did the spell of prediction help me? It, am I going to get to certain sections where I might take a wrong turn? It will say, did you cast the spell of prediction? No, absolutely not. What it did was it gave me ten ticks. If we didn't use the spell, we'd be doing exactly the same thing, but with an eight tick limit. And so... We, we'd kind of technically have more time. Essentially, when we double back and make mistakes, it's going to cost us less time because we we were able to navigate the space below decks so more effectively. It's not much, but it may be the very last thing that helps us, that last one or two ticks. Now... I'm going to have a little fun with this. I hope. The air is thick and musty, but at least it is warmer down here than in the white mist enveloping the deck. Light trickles from a roastly flickering globe set into the walls of the passage. The floor seems to be made of amber, while the rest of the passage consists of archaically carved mahogany panels. Record a second tick. We can head forward towards the bow of the ship, ship or aft towards the stern. Now, traditionally, for millennia, for literally multiple thousands of years, the captain's cabin has always been at the back of the boat. Probably because that's where the rudder is and where the ship's wheel will be. And it's and he gets to look forwards and see the whole boat in front of him and, you know, keep an eye on the crew and see what they're up to. And we've been told that the emeralds are probably in his cabin at the back of the boat. But we've got ten ticks. And here's the fun thing. We might almost want to see what happens if the ticks run out. Let's head forwards and see what fun we can have. But be careful not to waste too much time. And with 10 ticks, it's going to be difficult to run out, although we're on two already. Coming to a door, you push it open and step into the crew's quarters under the forecastle. Bunks tiered in fours against the bulkhead fill most of the space, which is sufficient for at least a thousand men. Most of the bunks are empty, however, and the few occupants that are here are just heaps of dust, bone, and rotting clothing. Record another tick. Absolutely. Uh, we can examine one of the bunks or head towards the stern. Sure, we'll examine one of the bunks. We've, we're not even halfway through our ticks yet. The bunks are metallic, and each pallet is crisscrossed with a network of silver filigree. The flooring here is a sort of grey, springy wood. Like linoleum? This, this definitely feels like a very modern ship. Moving against one of the bunk posts, you jostle a dead crewman and are startled by its skeletal hand dropping to brush your hair. Shaken, you head towards the stern. Record another tick, which will put us on four ticks. If we only had eight, this would mean that we would be halfway to our limit already. 
So we're now heading in the correct direction towards the back of the boat. We've checked at the front just in case the emeralds were there. They were not. The Pirate King would probably keep the most valuable treasures in his cabin if he had not buried them somewhere else long ago. Record another tick. Okay. Five ticks. Getting a little serious now. You return to the steps leading up to the main deck. Mindful of the need of haste, you hurry further aft. Absolutely. And there we go. And yes, I am wasting time on purpose because I'm trying to have this play out a particular way. Add another tick to your list. Okay. If you wish to open a door at random and look in, sure, why not? You never know what we could find. Maybe someone who could tell us where the emeralds are. Have you encountered Psyche the Sorceress? Yes, we have. Did you slay Psyche? No, we fled from her. Inside the cabin lurks a strange, lustrous skinned creature with eyes of green fire. Its muscles flow like quicksilver and it gives a lion's roar as it sees you. Fortunately, it is pent within the confines of a mystic symbol and is unable to reach and rend you as it would like. Studying it, watching it prowl around the perimeter of the symbol with its hungry stare fixed on you, you begin to feel a buzzing pain behind your eyes. It obviously has some telepathic means for us attracting or stunning its prey. You quickly shut the door again, record another tick, and carry on. That takes us to seven ticks. We have three more. Hmm. Nearly, there we go. Arriving at a large circular door, you stand in confusion for a moment, then turn the handle in its centre. It opens in sections, unfolding like a flower carved of wine-dark wood, and you step through into a cabin. The furniture here seems to have been made for someone at least two meters tall. There is a bed draped with antique tapestries and a table on which several yellowing charts are laid out. Facing you between two shelves full of curios, there is another door. Write the code word Mifago under your list of ticks. Then add another tick to your list. That takes us to eight ticks. If we had not cast our spell, Time would have just run out. Assuming your time has not yet run out, will you look at the charts, search for shelves of the emeralds, or open the other door? We will look at the charts on the table. They surely must show some otherworldly locations. They are like no seafarer's charts that you ever saw. Places from history and fable are mapped on a grid of ellipses and converging lines. Some of the symbols scrawled around the margin are taken from Arcane, the Sorcerer's Script. Others you cannot identify at all. Add another tick. That takes us to nine ticks. If you wish to take some of the charts, several rolled up together count as one item, then record them on your character sheet. Why would we take Hongguk's chart? You know what? If there was anything a thief would find worthy of stealing, who can carry some more food? Um, we could leave the wooden peg here. No, we should leave it back in the world of men, somewhere serious where people... Um... Hang on, one, two. Oh, goodness, we did buy a lot of food, didn't we? Okay. Um, 
the harp. We're not going to abandon Fatima's silver key. It's a precious metal. Um, <laughs> we really don't need Prince Sasorian's astrological predict projections anymore. Oh, and item 9 is empty anyway. So, in that case... Just in case they may be that extra valuable. It's just occurred to me the grave error I may have corrected. Um, I may have caused by um, overburdening ourselves at this point. We have one tick left. We could open the other door or search for the emeralds on the, um, on the shelf. Sure. We should really do that now. Write the code word speculum alongside any you have already recorded. In your hasty search, you spill dozens of bizarre artifacts and curios onto the cabin floor. Much as you would like to, there is no time to investigate them now. Pulling the lid off a clay jar, you pour out its contents. Two sparkling emerald eyes. The eyes of the Hatuli. Note these down. The two together count as one item for encumbrance purposes. And add two more ticks, taking us to eleven. Time has run out. However, who will carry these? These are a... These are probably a Remy or Ariadne. Let's see. Remy wants them because they're valuable. Ariadne is the magic person. Brother Kern has the common sense. And we... We will ditch Prince Sasorian's astrological projections, as we surely have no more need of them. Ariadne doesn't need to be carrying all this food. The Hatuli's Emerald Eyes. And we will pop our food here on the understanding that we may be replacing it with something else in the not-too-distant future. Time has run out. We are at 148, which I will write in here just in case we come back here. It's time to go to section 422, the one that has been waiting for us to run out of time. You may have recorded some code words while exploring the ship. Mythigo, if you have Mythigo, Nexus and Speculum, we have Mythigo and Speculum. If you have Mythigo and Nexus, if you have Mythigo and Speculum, if you have Mythigo only. Mythigo and Speculum is 505, I believe. Let's... Unless I forgot to write one of them down. The other door to the cabin suddenly flies open. Harsh, grey-blue light floods in. A figure stands there whose shoulders are as broad as the beam of a Mercanian longboat. Even in this tool cabin he has to stoop. His harness of pitted iron plates tolls like a bell as he raises his arms. In each hand he holds a gore-splattered axe. Who presumes to steal the Reaver's hoard? he thunders. You'll pay with your blood for this villainy! You waste no time in sizing him up. You can see when you are outclassed. There is no point in battling with him anyway. You have what you came for. You retreat through the other door and race for the companion wave. From behind you come the echoes of his clanking footsteps. We have avoided, for now, an extremely brutal confrontation with Hunguk the Pirate King. A sense of impending disaster quickens your pace as you make your way back to the deck. Something whizzes past, just missing you as you emerge from a companionway. Strange objects, creatures like conjoined trapezoids, are flitting through the air all around. 
Whenever they touch the hull or rigging, they explode in a fountain of red sparks. Gusts of wind thunder across the deck, parting the mists with sheets of freezing drizzle. Ahead you can see only a black void. You turn. The view aft is like peering out of a tunnel. You see the island and the waters of the gulf tinged by the afterglow of sunset, but they are receding with alarming speed. The Devil's Runner is leaving the earthly plain. We did not arrive on the ship by means of a flying horse, and if we did... Old Shabir, the ship's helmsman, would have stolen the horse and escaped, I believe. We came on a boat in a terrible state of barely seaworthiness. We did not swim. Let's hope our boat can get us to safety. The bad went, that's wrong. That is completely wrong. Uh, 505, wasn't it? And 185. Yeah. Could have sworn it was 365. Um... Came about 369. Okay, not 365. Got it. Got it. You scramble down the mooring chain to which you tied your boat. Bent over the oars, you exert all your strength to row away from the Devil's Runner and out of the interplanar vortex before it is too late. Oh, let's hope it's not too late. Reaching the shore of the island, you turn to watch the departure of Hongguk's ship. The fog thickens about its sides until it is only visible as a blur of shadow inside the pink sunset-lit cloud. Then a wind seems to catch the fog, though you can feel no breeze and sucks it away into thin air. Only a few strands of mist are left, trailing across an empty sea. There is no sign of the Devil's Runner. The last waves from its wake lap at the shingle by your feet, and when those are gone, the ocean all around lies still and silent under a canopy of awakening stars. Now. You enjoy a good sleep and get up sometime after sunrise. Each wounded player can restore endurance points equal to half his or her rank for the rest, rounding fractions up, plus one additional point for your breakfast of fruit. If you left your armour here before visiting Hongguk's ship, you can now put it back on. If we had swam out there, we would have had to leave our armour behind, I think. Now you must turn your thoughts to getting off this island. We were not brought here by the rock even though we know the words to command it. We came by boat. Very well. Now, our boat was a shambles when we bought it. We were constantly bailing out water when we got here. We've sailed through a st two storms, if we count the Dendon. You cast a critical eye over your boat. It has brought you a long way, but it's time to accept that it has seen better days. The chance of it reaching the mainland in one piece is negligible. The notion of travelling in it to your rendezvous in Hackbad is simply farcical. You must think of some other plan, or wait for Providence to hand you one. And with that, I think I'm going to end tonight's adventure here. However, I'll do a side episode showing what would have happened if we had not found the emeralds before encountering Hongguk for Pirate King. I could tack it on the end of this one, but if I do it as a standalone video it might be a little bit more fun. Um, I will say that there are a lot of very hard fights in this adventure, and we don't get experience points for winning fights. We get experience points for completing the adventure, and as such 
most of the hardest fights are best left avoided. Additionally, most of those hard fights are actually extremely lethal as a punishment for failing to avoid the fight. So we really are better off avoiding. I mean, we can literally get through this adventure with something like three or four fights, I think, potentially. Uh, no, no, may maybe a few more than that, but you know, we can essentially s pass by a lot of the more dangerous fights. And as such, I think I'll do standalone episodes featuring those so we can enjoy their deadly nature together. With that, I'll be ending tonight's episode here. I hope you'll enjoy this one, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in the next one. Also, feel free to give me your thoughts in the comment section down below about the cunning avoidance of particularly deadly fights. I'll see you all in the next one soon, where I will battle Hongguk for Pirate King, possibly even a best of three, for your entertainment. Bye for now, everyone. See you all soon.